<laughs> okay here now get ready for one of the most powerful interviews that you've ever seen this is thatch win this guy came over to america when he was five years old from vietnam the story is incredible today this guy has a hundred million dollars worth of real estate and he started as a real estate agent in 1990. this guy got up to where he was selling 150 properties a year door knocking so he tells the whole story how he transitioned into being an investor and he still does real estate agent activities today he's 53 years old and this guy has been somebody that i have watched for a while i love his content he has a million organic followers on instagram and he puts out just incredible stuff it's all focused on real estate investing and i love his message behind it his message is, is goes something like this own real estate right don't trade it he's not really into flipping he's not really into wholesaling he's not really into being an agent per se he's okay with using those vehicles to take that money and invest in a real estate that you're going to keep long term so long term holding of rental properties is where it's at this guy develops entire apartment complexes uh, he buys ugly houses and renovates them um, and keeps them forever as rental properties it's amazing what he's doing it was such an honor to spend well over an hour with him and you're really going to enjoy this one so go ahead smash the like button click subscribe leave me a comment when you hear something that resonates with you and let's get right into it you know bring agents into the brokerage or do a, do an affiliate deal that pays me residual every month I'm, i make money forever you know or a long time off that one transaction but your real estate commission checks is just a vehicle to actively invest in real estate long term. Their business model to teach you how to be top agent. Mm -hmm. I'm an agent. I know that they're small thinker. They say they dream big, but they really dream small. Because the biggest they dream is the ceiling of being a realtor. What, what, what do you say to people like that that may be a little hesitant right now with the market? And uh, what, what's your strategy right this second with, with the way the market is? Yeah. When you're a realtor, right? at some point you're like, I'm just tired of talking to seller and negotiating price reduction. You know what I mean? You get tired of that, right? When you're young, you want to raise capital. You want to do all this stuff. Then you get older, you're like, I don't report to this. I don't want to report to the investor. I don't want to tell them bad news anymore. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Today, we have one of my favorite people online, especially in the real estate investing space um mr thatch win what's up bro what up what up what up what up what up <laughs> where are you at today man you in seattle i'm in seattle right now man just hanging uh tight all the way till uh december then uh we're going to japan for like three weeks for the rest of the year okay perfect man perfect that's you guys do that every year yeah we usually take december off and then we travel uh mm -hmm. somewhere you know overseas somewhere yeah, yeah yeah beautiful man so y'all go somewhere different every year yeah uh you know uh the year before that we went to vietnam you know and then singapore um but most of the time it's overseas you know to go visit family in vietnam and then hop all through bali and singapore um that kind of stuff but this year we're just gonna go hang in uh, japan you know and do all the osaka and kyoto for like three weeks and then call it good for the for the year <laughs> Yeah, man, that sounds like a blast. I've never even been to any of those places. So yeah, bro. Um, I'm it's definitely like gonna venture over. Real. Yeah, for sure. Um, now I appreciate you doing this. Um, I mean, just a little bit for my audience, and then I want to kind of I've got to hear the story here because I know a little bit about it. Um, I know you started out as a real estate agent, right? And then you kind of transitioned into to investing and everything like that. So I want to hear all about it. But just for people listening, that year's been in the game since the 80s. Right. And uh, he's amassed a, a amassed a uh, real estate portfolio of over a hundred million dollars. Yep. And uh I'm just super excited, man, to to have a chat with you. So just take me back, man. I I want to hear because oh it's kind of similar. Um, I started in 02 as a real estate agent. I got to where I was selling a hundred properties a year as a single agent, you know, mostly listings and stuff. So a lot like what I've heard from you and some of your content when you talk about being a real estate agent and everything. So and, but I did start in 2002 versus the 80s, right? I was born in the 80s, so I couldn't get my license quite yet. So uh, now take me back, man. I want to hear this story. Yeah. So, you know, um, so I was born in Vietnam in 1970. So I'm 53 years old. 
And my dad worked for the U.S. military at the time as a translator. And in 75, the Vietnamese communists were invading South Vietnam. And the U.S. troops pulled out of South Vietnam. And my dad basically, um, you know, said to us, hey, we're going to leave with the U.S. troops. Because when you, when the communists is coming in, and if you're Vietnamese, you work for the U.S. troop, you're pretty much going to get, you know, killed. Right? Um, and, um, so it was like a one phone call kind of thing. My dad's like, Hey, us troop is pulling out. They, uh, we can get out of here in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, I'm going to come home. Want you know, grab everything. You know what I mean? What we got, I'm going to pick you guys up and let's go try to pick up all of our other cousins and, uh, on everybody. And let's, let's head out to the airport. Now, um, the airport is up in the city. We live more toward the countryside. So my dad had to drive all the way to the countryside, pick everybody up, and try to go by all my aunts and uncles and grandma's house, trying to get everybody and to drive back into the city. That's where the big airport is, so he can get out of there with the U.S. trips and everything. My dad got home. We packed everything. We had like a suitcase for the whole family with this uh, four of us and my sister was, you know, obviously I'm still my mom's stomach. And um, and we went by trying to figure out all my aunt and cousin, man. Nobody was there. It's just destiny. You know what I mean? Um, Nobody that's was why there? The people in Vietnam, right? There, there wasn't there. There's yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought it was just a regular day. Uh-huh. But you know, I always say to people, you know, especially for the people listening, you know, when the doors are open, you got to jump in. Mm. Nobody's going to push you in, folks. You know, the door is open for my dad, right? You should leave the country. And my dad basically says, all right, we're leaving. Had no money, a hundred bucks. And um, he jumped in and, you know, we got to the last plane. We flew out the U.S. troop and we just had to just figure it out. We landed in San Diego, um, uh, uh, lived in the shelter out there, Camp, Mer- Camp Pennington with the barracks for all the refugee out there and uh, stayed there for about a month. And then we got shipped up to another refugee camp up in Seattle, stayed there for like two months. And then uh, a gentleman named Charles Zettler, you know, who was a sponsor at the shelter, sponsor our family, go live with him and his mom. And we lived there for about two years. And then we finally moved up in the heart of Seattle. And um, and we rented a two-bed and one bath house for eight of us. And uh, my dad was the only one working. And pretty much, man, my life just started from there. So how old were you when you guys... Did, I was five happened. years old when we left. Yeah, you were five. We left the country, we left the country in 75. Uh-huh. I was and five. How many, how many were with you, with your family, your aunts and uncles and cousins? How many How many were with you? Nobody, bro. They were gone. They all just out kicking it, having a good time. They, oh, they, they were out that. doing stuff. They were out doing stuff. They didn't realize that the communists is coming in town. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, oh, okay. So your dad had inside information. We got to get out of here. Nobody even knew. Nobody, at that time. The whole city, the whole city didn't even know that the U.S. troop was pulling out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then your dad just had this opportunity of a lifetime, really, to to basically get come here. And this is why I always say, Ricky, how many opportunities we have as a lifetime on our journey, and we don't take it. Wow, your life is totally different than what it I mean that that moment transformed everything. everything. Wow. I went back to Vietnam for the first time probably like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I see all my cousins, you know what I mean, just hanging out, you know, in the village where mm-hmm. we live. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, that one decision that my dad took the opportunity to go through those doors when the mm-hmm. when his boss said you should fly out with us. If he would have said no, my dad would have been killed. And then we would have been living in that village with the dirt road with all my other cousins. Yeah. 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 It's destiny. You know, I, uh, think I, about I, it, how scary that could be. Right. My dad was 34. Mm-hmm. My mom was 29. Had no, had no money. Didn't speak no English. And about to leave the country in the United States. What? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's the worst damn thing you think about real estate investing? <laughs> yeah right. right now that's incredible man so um wow so like 
I, I watch TV shows and stuff, right, about people who live in these other countries, like what you're saying, in these villages and stuff. Yep. And um, sometimes when I, I travel to different countries, I've never been to any of those countries, but but I've been to some countries. OK. And, you know, I'll, I'll, even like in the even like in the islands right here in yeah. the Caribbean and stuff, you know, you go to some of those islands and yeah. you just start to think about the infrastructure, just just the infrastructure that we have here you know, compared to some of these places. And, and <laughs> you start to think, man, like we live like Kings and Queens over here and we don't even realize it. We take it for granted. All the stuff yeah. that we had, it's kind of like when a hurricane hits here, we have hurricanes that hit here, live on the Alabama Gulf coast yeah. and we'll be without power and, and internet and stuff for a couple of days, you know, <laughs> and it's just like, we're just like, what do we do? We're living in hell, you know, without this stuff. That's why um, I say for the U S people, our worst day is the best day for third world country. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in the United States, well, that's why I tell people, if you're tired, you're nine to five and you want to get into, let's say being a realtor, a real, real estate investor, the worst thing that can happen if you fail, but your failure is still beyond the third world country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, 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 you still go home to air conditioned, uh, house that's it that's it <laughs> sleep on a mattress that's it. <laughs> it is man um it's it's what we're accustomed to so and what we grew up with here and so you know we just don't even realize it so um all right and then so so what happened from there like um you started going to school i guess elementary and yeah, everything in school. uh seattle yep i went to school i graduated uh in 1990 uh 1988 Mm -hmm. And then I went to college. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in college. So my two older brother was all in the aviation business. They let to fly. Mm -hmm. So um, the um, they one of them went to aviation school to fix airplane, and they also he also wanted to fly. So I decided to follow my one of my older older brother footstep. So I went to school with him. He was like you know two year three year older than me, and so I went to school with him to learn how to fix aviation. So I got my degree as an AP mechanic to fix airplane. By the time I, I didn't have any money, I was living with my mom and dad, and so I um, so I wanted to work for Alaska Airlines, right? Because oh yeah, a mechanic for Alaska, that'd be cool, right? But you get sent out to Denver, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. like, and I got no money. I don't want to live out there. It'd be lonely by yourself. I'm not interested in taking that job. So I was working at Safeway full time a body shop full time and parking cars on the weekend at a Chinese restaurant. Mm. And I remember sitting at the bar and the daughter of the Chinese restaurant owner, her name was Linda. She was studying for her real estate license. And I'm like, what are you studying? She said, I'm studying for my real estate license. I said, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to get my license and, you know, probably, you know, use it to maybe help some people buy real estate, but I want to have it just to one day I can you know buy real estate. She's like, you should do real estate with me. Cause you got a good mouthpiece. I think you do well. You make 7% commission, which you know not you and I know that you don't get all that money. Uh, and I get excited. I'm like, ooh, really? I, I, I do have a good mouthpiece, right? And so in 91, I took my real estate license, I passed it. Okay. And then Linda and I went and worked for this Windermere office, which thank God it was a big name brand. And in 91, I got my license, but the first three years, Ricky, I was sitting around and I was just looking at this desk and this telephone, like, what the hell am I supposed to be doing all day long? Mm. And then Mike Ferry came to town and a bunch of agents would go in there and they're like, that you should go. Cause you gonna like this guy. He got a good go get a personality. Mm -hmm. So I went to Mike Ferry workshop in Seattle and uh, I was like, man, I like this guy. And he was offering coaching at the time, $300 mm -hmm. to be a coach half an hour every other week with one of his coaches. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got to do it. I was so, mm -hmm. but $300 was like, 10 grand a month for coaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, oh my God, man. I worked so hard for all my other money. I'm going to give this man $300. But I just said, I'm going to kick the door down and I'm going to walk through the door. So I paid the man $300. And on my first year with Mike Ferry, I only sell like three homes a year for the first three years. One, two, three, second year, three homes, second year, third year. And then on my fourth year, which is when I met Mike Ferry my first year, I think I sold like 10 houses. Mm -hmm. Right. And then he started teaching me scripts. He started teaching me about. And you were doing calls. real estate on the side at this point, right? It was like you, right. were, you were doing other things full job. time. Mm. Yep. 
So what happened was I did my first year. After my first year, I just gave up the body shop and basically uh, parking cars on the weekends. So I was mixing half and half Safeway and real estate. And my second year, I did like 20 deals and I just dropped away Safeway completely. Okay. And at that time, I was door knocking 100 doors a day, five days a week. And um, Jeez. every day, bro, I was out there door knocking every day because that's what Mike was preaching. Mm-hmm. 100 doors a day. I memorized my script. I had a flyer. I told my wife came and dropped me off, take the car so I don't have to get back in the car. And I just made, I made a commitment. I'm going to knock on 100 doors. I'm going to pass out the flyer. If no one's home, they're home. I'm going to give them the flyer. So that's how I can count. I did 100 doors. Mm-hmm. So I Monday through Friday, I got dropped off like 8, 30, 9 in the morning. Rain, cold, snow. I just made it happen. And I got dinner around 1 o'clock. I told her to pick me up. She bring me back to the office. And then uh, we would eat there. And then I used to see all my appointments, like, you know, 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the evening. So in the morning, I would generate business. In the evening, mm. I would either show houses or list houses. Mm. And I did that every day, Rick, for 10 years straight. Wow. Every day. Wow. And I was for 10 100 years, doors years. between 8.30 and 1 o'clock every day. Yeah, every day, five days a week, Monday through Friday. You were in shape, huh? Man, I got in shape. <laughs> And so were you, I did. Were that. you jogging? Were you jogging in between in between houses? Or were you running oh, yeah. to the next one? Oh yeah, right. And yeah. I did that for ten years, and then uh, I shifted different things. But I still was out there door knocking and cold calling. Mm. Even today, I still cold call and door knock a lot of mm. property. Mm. Mm. But today, in my blood, you know what I mean. So you did that for ten years, and and you got up to selling hundred properties a year like that. I was selling at that time. Me, my wife, and one assistant. I was selling at my peak in two thousand and seven. I'm sorry, 2005, so I, yeah, somewhere between 2005 and seven, I was doing about 150 deals a year, mostly all mm-hmm. listening. Like, just mm-hmm. me, my wife, Cammie, she was the assistant, right? Handle all the paperwork, and then one buyer agent. Mm-hmm. And and I was making close to like a million dollars a year at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I met, I met a uh, a mentor. His name was Saul. I worked for Windermere uh, from '94 to like '96. 798, I worked for Windermere and saw had an office called John of Scott, which is another big brand in Seattle. And he said, Hey, I see you young. You're like the talk of the town around Seattle. Come work for me. And I'm like, What's the benefit? I didn't know. He's like, Look, you can be rich selling real estate, but while I would do it, I teach how to own real estate like me. Okay. I'm like, I'm listening. So can And this was after 10 years of doing this. So what happened was. I did three, I did like four years at Windermere and I switched office. I went to Saw and Saw met with me, Cam and I, every month, once a month to actually help us take our money, make real estate and buy rentals. Mm, mm. Uh, my job was get out in the morning, door knock, go make money. Cammy's job was to take the money, right? And then just buy rentals. Mm. Uh, every time I dock, door knock a door, if it looks good, we'll buy it. Right. And that's how I just build my portfolio, one door at a time. And so I made my money from selling real estate, took the commission. Mm-hmm. I lived at home uh, all the way from, I started real estate in 91, right? I didn't leave the house. I didn't leave my mom's house until about my first house, which was, I want to say, 2000. You bought your first house in 2000? Yep. Okay. So meaning my first primary house I live in. Right, right. 1997 until my primary, I bought like 13, 14 property rentals. Okay, okay. And these, and these were- money by rentals. And you were buying, you were buying the ones you were door knocking. It wasn't properties on the market or whatever that you saw or through other people. You were, you were finding these sellers yourself. That's right. So basically, like my first house, I door knocked the owner. The owner wanted to the sell. They wanted one ten for the house, and I was gonna get six commission, six percent commission or seven percent commission at the time. And I was like, you know what? I like your house. You think I can buy it for one ten minus seven percent commission? They're like, I don't care. And I'm like, okay. And then I bought it. Hmm. Like that. Yeah, and that's wow. how I did all my, that's how I bought a lot of my property. I was out door knocking for listings. And if it's something I like, I'd ask the owner, can I buy it for this price? Minus my 7% commission. And they're like, no problem. Cause they left the same amount of money. Yeah. And I just bought. And what, do you remember that first house you bought for 110 minus 7% what you rented it for? Bro, I still own it today. It's my first house. Yeah. I bought, I bought it. Actually, I bought it for, they wanted 110. I bought it for 105. Mm-hmm. I put down 5% first time home buyer. Mm-hmm. And today, right, uh, that house is worth like 750 and we rented it out for like 3,500 bucks. 
Mm-hmm. And I think at the time we were only running for like a thousand bucks back in the days. Yeah. 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 So when you were door knocking all these doors and you were selling a hundred plus properties a year, making a million bucks, which is a lot more money back then than it is today. Um, mm-hmm. Were all of your deals coming from the the doors or were, were you taking, I mean, when you knock a hundred doors a day, right? You're talking to a lot of people that aren't buying today, that aren't selling today. Did you have something in place to to stay in touch with everybody you talk to, you know, and did, did, did it end up being kind of a snowball there where, you know, maybe half the deals you were getting were coming from people that were ready to go now that you door knocked. And then the other half were coming from people you door knocked last year or the year before that kind of came back to you. Yep. yep. So, you know, back in the day, remember, remember a program called top producer. Uh, huh. right. So I was knocking and sometime I get people right in there. And then sometimes people say, call me back you know, a year later. Then I, I will write their name on a piece of paper, right? And then I go back and then I will input it into top producer and say, my fear, I'll just say, if they say a year, call them back in six months. Mm. And so what happened was I would door knock a new stuff. And in the afternoon, after lunch, right? I do a, at least an hour follow-up. Mm. So I do five hour door knocking in the morning, an hour follow-up in the afternoon. And then I go see my appointment in the evening. Mm-hmm. And I was routine over and over and over and over. So I, I kept bringing in more leads to the front, whatever I could do right there. And then whatever, other than that, I go into top producer. Mm-hmm. And then after the, you know, the first year I didn't have no referral because nobody want right. to work with a 21 year old kid. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And if there was, it was my dad's friend who I showed their houses, sell them out and then they want half my commission. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I want half your commission, right? And so, um, and so that's what happened. I, five hours, Whatever, whatever, don't do. I put them in top producer, and I just keep do routine over and over and over and over. I just kept that system over and over, and it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Um. And so, like, this is what I think a lot of real estate agents don't really get is that they're not going to sell forever. Yeah, it's yeah, a rat race, right? It is. And. You know, they may say, I love selling and I love, you know, going on listing appointments and showing stuff. And they might now, but there's going to come a time. I know it did for me. And I was one of the ones that said I love selling. Um, But then it got to the point where, you know, it hits you like a ton of bricks. It's like, I can't do this anymore. Like every time I sell something, I don't make any more money unless I go sell something else and something else and something else. And it's just an ongoing. and, And you have to always be present there. Yeah. I mean, like if you're on vacation 30 days in Vietnam, mm-hmm. the machine stop. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Because you got off the treadmill. <laughs> we went to uh, Disney last week, just a full week. Like one of our, you know, we take like maybe one big vacation where we just completely unplug. And, you know, for me, I got out of production as a real estate agent last March. And, um, and being there th- that la- last week, you know, knowing that all the money that I got coming in passive, all my stuff is passive now, you know, that money just keeps rolling in whether I'm there or not. And that's a good feeling. But I think real estate agents, they're like, they don't, they don't think that far ahead. They're just trying to get make a big business now. And what I'm trying to teach agents is, you know, there's going to come that day where you don't want to be an agent anymore. And you can't wait till then to start trying to build your portfolio. You got to start picking up rental properties now so that by the time you do, uh, you know, get that feeling that you got to get out of the business, man, pe- eight, clients were calling me and I was cringing looking at the caller ID, you I, know, it'd be like a million dollar deal. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk to this person. That's how bad it, it it was there at the end. But um, I tell people, you know, start investing early so that you've got something coming in where at some at, at towards the end when you decide you, you may or may not want to sell you might continue selling but it's only because you want to at that point and then when you don't want to you can kind of step away what was the point for you that you got to the point where your where your investment business and income and portfolio was big enough okay to leave a million dollar plus business over here did you did you put a team together to, to run that? Do you still make money on commissions? Did you sell the real estate business? What what did the transition look like? Because I, I know a lot of agents are thinking, man, how do you go from making all this money as an agent to being done with production and just go all in on investing? Right. So it, 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 nobody go all in. So for me was, 
when I was doing like at my peak, like 150 some deals, you know, it's 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 one of those kind of things where it's like I would be mentored by my mentor, Saul, and he owns a lot of property. And I, you know, thank God he always blowing in my ear passive income. There's a lot of real estate coach out there. Their niche is to teach people how to be top realtor. Mm -hmm. Can't hate them for that. Because that's what their business plan is all about, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I was out there getting coached by Tom Ferry, Mike Ferry, and all these people. And they teach me how to be a top agent. Thank God I had Saul because Saul took my focus from agent. I, I see him like this. They, they, their goal, they think big. I did a, you know, a, a, a 50, they want to do 150 deal. And their highest horizon they can see is still being a realtor. Mm-hmm. Saul took my horizon and it took me way beyond being a realtor and took me out here and go, when you have kids, do you want to keep selling real estate? And be at the beck and call of a client. So he had me look at that horizon and then work backward in my business plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most realtors look at their their horizon is one day I'm going to do 500 transactions with a team of 50 and then Mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So they're always always on the treadmill just running faster. And so for me in 2005 and seven. I was just tired, man, going and listening to presentation. And, you know, when the market's good, shit's selling easy. When the market is down like where it is, you got to convince the owner price got to go down. And then they blame you for not doing a great job. They want to fire you. It got to the point I'm like, man, I'm so tired of this shit, right? And so for me, I was like, you know what? The first thing I said to myself, I'm going to stop working with buyers. So the first thing I let go was, of course, I had buyer agent. Buyer agent, when they're good, they take off. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what happened was, I had buyer agent, they're good, they take off. And I got to the point where I was like this. Here's what I'm going to do. I don't even care. I had one or two good agents in the office. I said, I'm going to do you, let's work out. If I get a good deal, I'm going to say, you're going to be my buyer agent on, on the team. But you still work for your own company, right? Mm-hmm. Just, we split the buyer fee 50-50. And when they get back, when the buyer get done, you put it back in my database. They're like, done deal. So I'll go, I'll people call me, hey, I want to buy a house. Great, my buyer agent's got to show. That way they never have, they, I don't have to be responsible keep feeding them, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So my first replacement was just get rid of the buyer for 50%. Okay. And then what happened was, then the next set of things I did was get rid of all the seller who I don't know okay. to someone. Mm-hmm. Or 70%, 30% for me. Mm-hmm. Right, you do all the work, you give me back my seller. Okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I get big fat commission checks for all those two. Actually, I'll take that back. It was 50 50 on listing, 70 30 on buyer. They keep right. 70 they get 30 percent. That's what it was. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. and now I'm at a point now, Ricky, that I'm only working with builders and seller who I know. Okay, so okay? you're so still listing know. stuff, you're still I doing still agent stuff. activities. Yeah, mm-hmm. I still do it. Me, my wife, Cammy, and one assistant. So on the day that I'm listing to stuff uh, for my friend, right? Like my friend just called me and said, that I want to sell four of my rental property. So we listed it just a couple weeks ago and we list all four of them. Cammy still does all this stuff again. And all the offer comes in. We see it. We do everything over the phone. So mm. it's not really a big deal for us. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We just listed seven houses for the builder. We sold the land to, so we get all the list back. But now we even had a part start. We've been on a part now in my career now that we don't even want, we still do probably like 70 deals from listings. Mm. So right now we've been talking about next year. We want to start giving away those listings to someone mm. for a 50, 50 split. And so I never gave away everything. I slowly graduate, you know what I mean? Mm. And so I still make money on the listing side on referral, or I still do my listing, but I spend most of my time now going out there prospecting ugly houses. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I still prospect. I have a group of people that prospect and I got a whole bunch of people on the street, other agent, other wholesale on the street that they know that I'm out looking for ugly houses and tear down property. Mm-hmm. And that's what I focus on. Now, if I find it myself, if I don't like it, I will list it, but I have somebody else go list it for me mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's like me. I've got my dad and he handles all the listings and sales. 
So I can kind of do what I do and we split everything. We split expenses. We split the commission. So I still do the advertising and stuff and, you know, whatever. But he kind of handles the day to day where I can kind of do, do my thing on the investment side and content creation and stuff like that. So that's it. pretty similar. Real estate agent, they got to understand that. Yes. Let's say you losing 500 grand, but you probably spent 70, 80% of your time doing a million, but mm-hmm. if you lost 500 grand and if you took away majority of that 70% and you went and invest, you will make a lot more than 500 grand with that same, you know, even time. 60% of your mental space going creating mm-hmm. wealth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least, and you have something for tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Commission, you, you, you're done. Get it and it's done. Well, for me, it was, uh, for me, it was, like when I, when I do a deal, a listing or sell, then I get paid on that, on that listing or sell once, yeah. you know, versus when I do an investment deal that I plan on keeping or, you know, bring agents into the brokerage or do a, do an affiliate deal that pays me residual every month. I'm, I make money forever, you yeah. know, or a long time off that one transaction. And so I just yeah. focus my energy on more, more residual passive type businesses where when I make a sale, I'm getting paid for a long time off that one activity, that one right. sale versus real right. estate. That's what that's the one thing I didn't like. But but with being a real estate agent, you can make so much money if you're a hard worker that you can take that money and then kind of transition into these passive businesses and stuff. And like you said, agents just don't think that far ahead. No, I want I want to say this for agent too. It didn't dawn on me until after I left. Well left most of the, my energy away from being an agent. But your real estate commission checks is just a vehicle mm. to actually invest in real estate long-term. Mm. Mm-hmm. You have to look at it like that if you're an agent. Mm. The problem most agents look at their real estate vehicle as a platform where they can be number one. Yeah, right. Right? But number one doesn't pay you residual for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You get mm-hmm. old and crusty, right? You be done, and you got nothing else for the rest of your life. I I, I know agents that literally died oh. calling for sell by owners. I know two mm-hmm. of them. They they made calls, both of them. They died, they died from old age. They were in their late seventies, early eighties, and we they knew they were dying. Yeah. And like we got the news that this one agent Bob, you know, he was not doing well. Well, he was in the office the next day calling expires, and we were like, what is going on here? And the thing was, was he was trying to make, he was trying to make as many sales as he could to leave as much as he could for his wife because he knew he was going to pass away. And then he made calls all the way up until three days before he died where he couldn't get out of bed. And then he passed away. And that was back in 2011 or 12 when that happened uh, to, to these agents in my office. And I was like, uh, uh-uh. yeah, you would have had some <laughs> rental property. You could have left, you could have left a lot more than a fucking commission check. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he was just trying to build money in the bank. Right. No, it's, it's, it's crazy how there's not a whole lot of people that talk about it. And certainly your broker is not going to teach you this, no, right? They don't even, most of them don't even teach it. You know, I mean, look, as much as I love Tom and Mike Ferry, their business model to teach you how to be top agent. Mm-hmm. And if I'm an agent, I know that they're small thinker. They say they dream big, but they really dream small. Because the biggest they dream is the ceiling of being a realtor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Think outside the ceiling of a realtor. Yeah. Right. And so uh, that's the problem. You know what I mean? That they think inside this box called realtor, right? The top agent can make 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million a year. Half of it, I go, Uncle Sam, you still mm-hmm. ain't got nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You got a nice lifestyle, but you got no rental, you got no asset. Yeah. The most daunting thing for me was January 1st. Oh, yeah. You got to start when, over, when, all over again. Yeah. When the, when the million dollars, yeah, I was making a mil, 1.1 a year. And then, and then January one clicked and it went to zero yeah. and I was like, Oh, oh yeah, shit. I got to run. I gotta, I gotta climb this million dollar mountain again. And then, I, and then the doubt started setting in, you know, am I even going to be able to do that again? Like that was an incredible feat. Right. There's so much energy that goes. I want to say this to a lot of realtors out there. Listen, go learn how to be a top agent from a lot of the mentor out there. Also have another mentor to teach you about real estate investing. So you're going to have both. Yeah. Yeah. So so you never really let your real estate agent business totally go. You just kind of let bits and pieces of it go. 
it's been kind of a slow, gradual transition. Um, but th that's what I'm trying to get out of you just for the people listening. Cause most of, most of my following is real estate agents. And what would your advice be on transitioning from agent to maybe you don't let all the agent stuff go completely, but you but to get to a place where you don't have to sell anymore. You can take listings if you want to. You don't have to. How do you get to that place? Now, the key is if you're an agent right now, you don't own a rental. You got to take the opportunity and make as much money as you can with the vehicle called real estate commission checks. Then you got to go get a mentor that someone actually can really teach you how to own rental property how to buy the right rental property, how to buy the right location, how to maximize your ROI on your money. Then every time you make a commission check, right? And you save enough money for another down payment, buy yourself a rental. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to adjust your lifestyle because before you didn't have a rental because you didn't need no down payment money, you were living a good lifestyle. So you got to actually draw a line. You go, I need to do this so I don't actually die three days before the goddamn, you know what I mean? A uh, uh, 90 years old. So kill it. I tell all my agents today, kill it. And then you have enough money. Take that down payment, buy yourself another rental. So eventually you're going to accumulate one rental, two rental, three rental, four rental, five rental. Now you got rentals. You got things going. So eventually when you have enough rental and you have enough cash flow, then you can slowly tip the scale the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you got to start somewhere, folks. If you do it sooner or later, you can get the scale going this way. Hopefully... You have enough by the time you, you know, 90 years old, so you can leave all this asset mm -hmm. and the cash flow for the rest of your life, for, for your wife's life, or your husband's life, or the next generation coming through. So that's what I recommend all the agents. Go make your money. As soon as you make enough money, buy yourself another rental. Do it, folks. Trust me. What you're going to have to sacrifice, you got to just cut back on your expenses a little bit because mm -hmm. you're going to need the down payment to buy the next one and the next one. If you do that for the next, this is what I said Ricky, the other day. If someone actually bought one rental every year, depending on where they buy at, okay? Mm -hmm. If they only got to put down is, you know, 20%. Mm -hmm. They buy one rental every year. Let's say that the average price is 300000 and they have a 7% appreciation. In 10 years, that stuff will turn into like a million dollars with the assets, a couple million dollars with the assets. 10 mm -hmm. years again, that, that would do it turn into like five, 10 million with the asset. Mm -hmm. It's just a compound appreciation. It's like an avalanche. Yeah. When you say kill it, you're talking about their lifestyle, right? Living all this, spending all this money, you know, going out and eating all the time, doing all this right. stuff. You're saying kill that lifestyle, cut back a little so you can save up yeah, for down payment. Down payment money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because remember, if you don't have a, if you don't have a reason to buy a rental, because you always need, to, you know, 20% down. Most of the time, people never have that much money. They make a million and they spend half of the same, the other half, they live a great lifestyle, but they never have 20% to buy anything. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So the market right now, yes. all right, um, I'm buying houses every month. I'm oh, buying wow. commercial, yeah, you're right I'm buying there, baby. commercial, uh, duplexes, uh, new construction, existing homes. Like I'm buying stuff every month. I'm closing on deals. Um, I'm paying cash for some, I'm putting 20% down on some I'm doing, I'm just buying stuff. Um, I'm bullish and you know, I don't know what's going to happen short term. Um, but I feel pretty good long term. Um, you know, it's a good bet to make, but what would your advice be right now for people who maybe are new and trying to buy rentals or maybe somebody that's been in it for a couple of years, but they're just kind of scared, right? Cause they see all the headlines, you know, about price is going to come down and we're in this, you know, whatever, whatever. What, what, what do you say to people like that, that may be a little hesitant right now with the market and okay. uh, what, what's your strategy right this second with, with the way the market is? So here's what I know from doing this now for four decades. There is a thing called a 10-year cycle that happened. Mm -hmm. Every 10 years, the real estate market climbed, and then it had a two-year correction. Mm -hmm. 2022 was the hardest correction. 23, we're still going through correction, but it wasn't as hard as 23. Mm -hmm. And they say that we're going to carry this correction probably into somewhere in the first quarter, maybe even second half of 2024. Mm -hmm. 
And then the 10 year cycle is going to start again sometime in 2024. And when it does, it's going to ride another 10 year again, roughly. Mm-hmm. You're going to have another two year correction again after that. It's been historically been like that for me. I notice every decade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I hear a lot of my really smart people, right, talk about the 10 year cycle. So I know based on historic history, it repeat itself. The Fed's got to pull the throttle to raise the interest rate to slow down the machine a little bit, the train. Mm-hmm. It's inflation in, in control. And as soon as it's getting a little control, then the, the government's going to pull the throttle back to drop the interest rate to get the train moving again. Because they know when the real estate train does well, everybody does well. Mm-hmm. The car mm-hmm. business does well. The furniture store does well. The landscaping company does well. Everybody do well off that, right? Mm-hmm. And so I know right now it's a buyer's market, less than a seller's market. Mm-hmm. And right now I know that if I go buy a house right now, there's not too many competition on the house. Mm-hmm. I get a better price. I have time, Ricky, to actually even get an inspection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I got time to do feasibility. I got opportunity, more option, more leverage to actually get better terms. Close when I want to close, not when they need me to close. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got all that advantage right now. All right. Yes. I'm going to get a better price now than it is when the interest rate was at 4%, when I have to pay 50, 70, 100 grand, depending on where you live, a million dollar over asking price. I did a calculation the other day. If you had a loan amount for $300,000, interest rates are seven and a half, your monthly payment, right? Your, your, your uh, um, the monthly payment was like 20, something like um, like something like $2,100 or something like that. Mm-hmm. If someone wait, oh, I'm going to wait till we get to four and a half that I'm going to buy. Uh-huh. The $600,000 out of four and a half, your monthly payment is like $1,600. Bucks. So the difference is like $600 different in monthly payment a month if mm-hmm. you wait. Mm-hmm. $7,200 a year or $14,000 roughly in two years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here's what I know. When the interest rate get down to four and a half, you're going to pay more than $14,000 for a house mm-hmm. over asking mm-hmm. price. Mm-hmm. You're probably going to pay 50 grand. So you're actually saving more money now buying and refinance two years from now than mm-hmm. wait two years now to buy because you got low yeah. interest rate, but you got to compete against everybody. You got to pay more for the price, no inspection, buy as is, close uh-huh. when they want to. So for me, that's what I know. And I've seen it like that every decade. And so I'm buying now. Mm. So I get a good deal and I'm just going to refinance in the next two years. You think we'll get back to that crazy market? This is what all my people say. We won't get down into the threes or the low four. We'll probably be in the mid four and the high fours in 2025. Wow. And here's the thing. Even if it's at low five, Ricky, when I started real estate, shit, 12%, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 13%. I take 6% all day. So back when you started in 90 or so, the median home price is probably somewhere around $25,000, right? It was like, it was like at the, you know, some area was like $70,000. 70,000. Like interest rate was like 12%. Mm-hmm. And now, buying. and now the median home price is like 400 in the country yeah, in Seattle, my median price is like about six seven hundred thousand right now yeah 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 it's it's local of course nationally it's like in the low fours or whatnot um so it's went from like seventy thousand to six hundred thousand or whatever right but but household incomes haven't really increased uh as big of a percentage right mm-hmm. um and going from like 70 to 650 okay um some might say well how you know i mean it it, it like 10 x Right. You know, and some people might say, okay, well, are those homes going to 10 X over the next 30 years or, or however long that's been 40 years or, or you know, or, or, or you know, is, it, is that house going to be $6 million in 2050 or 2060? Um, you know, because that's what it would have to do to kind of produce those same, you know, quantitative, you know, uh, returns, um, like how much higher can it go? Does it have a lot to do with inflation? What, like, give me your thoughts on the future appreciation of the market over the next couple of decades. Just your thoughts. So I, I, I tell you my, my thought on Seattle, cause I study Seattle very hard. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we in Seattle for being a big metropolitan area, all price relatively is still very inexpensive compared to big cities. Mm-hmm. 
Now, when I say uh, average price of six seven hundred thousand, that's in a A minus neighborhood. When mm -hmm. I start, I was selling in the D plus C minus. Today, mm -hmm. that that same area, the sixty thousand house is probably worth. It's probably selling for about three fifty. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Right? This is the uh, the the more more expensive area, but that's not mm -hmm. even like the expensive area. So, in my opinion, what I've seen in the last four decades in Seattle. We have about a 7% appreciation on average. Mm -hmm. I mean, every 10 years, it doubles in value. Mm -hmm. So if history repeats itself and we continue to get a 7% appreciation, I mean, in the next 10 years, at the end of the next 10 year cycle, let's call it 2034, that $600,000 house could be worth $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I see it because here's the thing about Seattle, I can't speak for other cities. Seattle, I mean, like a lot of my students in Seattle, they all work for like Amazon. They all work for, you know, like Amazon, Microsoft. They mm -hmm. make good money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, so many of my students, I got students all across the United States, but students in Seattle, I mean, I see them because I get to meet them. Man, they all, they, they make husband and wife together making half a meal mm -hmm. in Seattle. Yeah. So in Seattle, to how to go from 600 to 1.2 million 10 years from now, you know what I mean? Uh, I think it's going to be doable. And I want to assume probably in Alabama where you're at, it's probably yeah. going to do something similar because you got a different price point. Yeah, it doubles about every 10 years, something like that. So, go. yeah. Um, now, nah. so, yeah, I'm buying new construction homes right now, D.R. Horton Homes. I'm buying a yep. fleet of them. I bought five of them. Um, nice. And they're oh, they're exactly. like, they're they're in the, the low threes. What do you rent them right? for? What's that? You, what do you rent those out for? Twenty five hundred. That's good. That's good money. So, so the so the Dr. Horton, yeah, I go through their financing. You're right. I'm getting five point nine on an investment loan. They're paying five thousand in closing costs. It's a brand new home with no maintenance for oh. years. The rent is great. It's in a beach area. I live on the beach in Alabama, so that's ten minutes from the beach. Nice. Um, you know, and so uh, these are four bedroom houses which is you know that's kind of what the market has went to pre you know post covid um but no i, I think these houses are worth 600 in 10 15 Easy. years and yeah. and and you said a key word though ricky you said it's near the beach you and i know location is the game is the key factor of everything in real estate mm -hmm. if you like in seattle we got the water the, the sound on one side we got the mountain on the other side we got canada on top we got mexico on the other end mm -hmm. We are being squeezed for land. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you say that, I can see when you're anything close to the beach, mm -hmm. you're squeezed for land too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're building a brand new Gulf Shores High School that's going to be state of the art, brand new, literally right across the street from this subdivision. So I'm like, let me go right there and just park some okay. money. Um. So when you look at rentals, right, you say you buy ugly homes. Okay. That's kind of what you focus on or whatever. Take me through that. You know, you see ugly house, you're like, oh man, let me, let me buy this thing. Nobody wants. See, this is why social media is such a funny thing. I just, somebody sent me another app uh, yesterday. They says, this guy says, bird strategy is dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Of course, they all like to use the word bird because it's, it's really a big name now, right? It's a, did you, it's did you come up with that? Is that yours? I think you know, you know, value add property been around yeah. for right, right, right. But but At as far point, as naming it Burr, I'm gonna name it Burr. And okay. you know, the last two years I made so many Burr video that everybody know that's you know talks a lot about Burr. So for me, mm -hmm. we live in an expensive area, and when you live in an expensive area, you can't just go buy a home like you for three hundred thousand and get twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. so you're gonna stay in Seattle, high end neighborhood. You have to do a lot of value add. Mm -hmm. You can't buy what I call moving condition home because it just eight hundred thousand dollar rent four grand mm. that ain't that ain't gonna work. Yeah, right. Too expensive. Too expensive. So what I do is in Seattle and now so many cities across the United States they allow extra structure in their backyard. Okay. North Carolina does it. Atlanta just got approved for that. Tampa just got approved for that. Orlando, uh, Arizona's got approved for that. Las Vegas got approved for that. Any big dense area, they they need to create more housing. 
So for me, if I talk about just the basic burr, if I know a regular house in the neighborhood can sell for 800000 my job is to go out there and find ugly houses in that same area so I can actually add value to make the house as worth as much as the $800,000 house. Mm. So the strategy for me is that in my area, I have home with basement. And so the where I can find the best deal is, is to find an ugly house that's two bedroom, one bath with an unfinished basement. Okay. So all I'm paying for is an ugly house, two bedroom, one bath. Mm. With the potential for more square footage in the basement, potential to make it look nice and make it worth more money. Mm. So typically I can buy a two bedroom, one bath ugly houses for about $500,000. Okay. To remodel the whole house like that, it will cost me about $125,000 inside out. Mm -hmm. I can be in it for, you know, six twenty five dollars or six seventy five dollars all in, but it's worth $800,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. My loan amount is going to be based off of six fifty dollars or six twenty five, dollars depending on how much money I leave in the deal. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when the interest rate was lower, I can finance 100% of my all-in number and make a cash flow. Now, interest rate is high. I have to leave my original 20% when I buy or purchase and rehab. I got to leave some of my 20% in there mm. so that I can actually create the cash flow temporarily now until I refinance later. Got you. Got so, you. So, basically, that's how I do I buy a new house. I rehab it. I make it worth mm. as much as the $800,000 house. Mm. I have all the sweat equity in it, right? The bank will always... Give me 70% of appraised value. Mm -hmm. 560, I'm all in for 560. I'm in good shape. But if 560, can I get with $4,000 a month for even or cash flow? If it right. doesn't, then I leave a little bit of money, like maybe bring it down to 500,000. Yeah. To cash flow. Right. Please wait. Yeah. Now, that's Seattle. If I taught somebody how to do that in Alabama, they can get the price for a lot lower. And mm -hmm. get twenty five hundred dollars. You see what I mean? Right, right. So all my students, if depending on where they live, I tell them buy turnkey, or you can buy value add property. Mm -hmm. And I teach them how to do both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So the burst strategy isn't dead. You just got to get more creative. Most of the people out there, they buy stuff. They just buy everything with no money, seller financing, and they buy it where there's no sweat equity in the deal. You got to get some equity so the loan amount will be low. Yeah. So, and then you, so you, you, you basically get all your cash back, right? So are, are uh, you paying, leave, are you, are you I paying leave, cash for these? Equity, I leave all my equity in the deal. But, but, the, but you, you take the cash that you put in it back out? I take my original down payment 20% yeah. back out. Yes. So, okay. Okay. So, so you're buying it for like 550 ish. You'll put 20% down on it. And then you'll. And then you'll and then you'll actually pay out of your pocket the one twenty five to to remodel it. Oh, uh, hard money lending will let's say five hundred thousand cost one twenty five. Mm -hmm. They will say all in for six twenty five. I just put twenty percent of six twenty five. Okay, so okay, so you do it through a hard money lender. You get all the money you need to buy it and rehab it. With twenty percent, you do down. the re you do the rehab. You get a new appraisal at eight hundred, okay. okay. and then you refinance it and get that money back. And I get I refinance it. If you get, I get, you get your money, down payment money back. That's it. Yeah. Now, the key is I got to get at least 25% in margin or higher. Mm -hmm. the right. Reason why, the bank only finance 70% of LTV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I loan the value of a new appraisal. And then That's you it. take that money you, that you got back, you've got your cash flow and property, and then you go do it again. Do it again. And the so key, people are. Get, that's why I always tell people when I do the burr, you got to get 25% in margin. Mm -hmm. So that they can finance 100% of your all-in number, purchase and rehab. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? And that way you get your all your down payment money back so you can do it again. Mm -hmm. What other people do that's different is they don't get enough. They don't get 25% margin. They get 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. And then they refi and they try to get their down payment and any equity. Like all mm -hmm. my property that's 25% or 30 or 40 feet equity, I mm -hmm. leave all my equity in the deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You I just want your down money. payment back. I want my down payment back so I can repeat it. Yeah. That's it. And then and then people are saying it's dead because the market is softened and they don't feel like you can get those margins. But they I think they think it's dead because interest rate's so high you can't cash flow. Yeah. It won't cash flow. Nothing cash flow. Everything cash flow if depending on how low the loan amount is. Mm. Right? Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you pay cash, you're gonna cash flow. If you borrow, if you borrow 10, 20%, then you're going to cash flow. 
That's right. So the key is you want to actually be all in on your loan with 100% of your down payment back on a loan amount where the rent will cash flow. So do you ever run into a situation? People, the problem most Burr people, they don't have a 25% plus in margin. Mm -hmm. do they you don't ever that, have it. Do you find that sometimes that you basically have to leave your down payment in there so it cash flows? Yes. Mm -hmm. In today's time, if you don't get 25, you get 20%, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. or you get 25% in, in equity, but mm -hmm. the price will happen to be a little higher. Mm hmm Oh, your loan amount is not a 500, but it's like 550. Mm. And you got to get it down to 500 to make it a cash flow. Then instead of leaving, instead of taking all 100,000 back, you leave 50 grand in, you get the other 50 back out. Mm. Mm -hmm. And do you like refinance that. it with a hard money lender or do you switch over to a conventional at that point? I switch over to a conventional. Yeah. Interesting. I have portfolio. I have a portfolio bank that does all my deals. Yeah. And then how many of these deals do you find? Like how many ugly houses, how many deals are like that pop up for you? Um, I do, I do, uh, I do ugly houses and I do, um, townhouses. Mm. That's my model, my top three model, ugly house with ADU, row houses and apartment building. Mm -hmm. And so in ugly houses with Dadu right now, I have right now, probably about 10 of those going right now. Mm. And then for townhouses, I have like, when I do townhouses, one development site is eight townhouses on it. Mm -hmm. So I have like three of those sites going right now. Mm -hmm. And those were like, older townhome developments that you picked up? Oh, oh they're raw. Oh, oh, oh you're, you're, you're developing down, them. And then I develop into eight brand new townhouses. <laughs> okay. So I do new construction also. Yeah. In a park builder, I break it, I tear it down from scratch, and I build brand new park buildings from scratch. Mm, yeah, that's a whole different game, huh? Because now it you're is. building in, the, you're 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 gaining that equity of being on the yeah. construction side. I just finished doing a 31 unit apartment building, I'm all in for 3.6 million, but it's worth 6.3 million right now. And you're just keeping it. I keep all of it. Yeah. See, See, that's that's the way I like to do it. And and look at this, Ricky. I do it all myself. No investment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do it all myself so all my invest investment right. property i have no investor i do it all myself so you don't you don't bring in needed. partners you don't raise money you don't do any of that stuff no you just yeah i now when i was younger i used to do that but when mm -hmm. you get older no different than when you're a realtor you just don't you want less headache mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah like when you're a realtor right? at some point you're like oh, i'm just tired of talking to seller and negotiating price reduction you know what i mean you get tired of that right when you're young, you want to raise capital. You want to do all this stuff. And you yeah. get older, you're like, I don't want to report to this. I don't want to report to the investor. I don't want to tell them bad news anymore. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. hey, everything's good. Everybody's happy. When it's not good, you tell them all the bad news. And then all that stress way on your shoulder day in, day out. Mm -hmm. So if you're smart, when you get to a certain point, you can go, you know, I don't need a thousand door. If I have 600 door, I'm happy. Because I'd rather have 500 door owner free, owner by myself than... Two thousand door that only oh I only own twenty five percent of it and that is seventy five percent owned by investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I've thought about raising money a couple times and uh, but I I've got all my stuff on my own right now. You know I don't do any like big stuff out of area. It's all local. I know the properties. I can drive to right. them. I can I rent them. I manage them. I do all that stuff. Right, right. Um, yeah, I like my thing is right now. I was thinking about it the other day. If I buy a property a month. For the next five years, I'll have about a hundred properties, right? Because I got about forty right now. I have I have a hundred properties, right? If they average a half a mil, that's fifty million. Yeah, yeah, right. And and then yeah. and then if if my if my loans are set up where they're paid off in 15, 20 years, hell, that fifty million is now worth a hundred million worth of property yeah. that's owned that's free it. and clear. I'm like, in twenty years, I could be I could have a hundred million free and clear. Easy, bro. Look, let me tell you how syndication works. Typically, syndication is that if you're lucky, you get 25% of the whole project. Mm. But typically, most syndicated guys, they usually have one or two or three partners. Mm. Let's call it two partners. Mm. Let's say you get 25%. Grant Cardone get 25%. He get the high side. Mm. He raised all the capital, a 9,000 door. He get 25% of the portfolio. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. So let's say 25% is you and your partner. I mean, you really got 10% or 12%. Uh-huh. If you have 14 doors, 
that you own by yourself is equivalent to 140 door 10 percent of mm. 140 doors right 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 the difference I, I see what you're saying yeah right? yeah I, so, but you're managing 140 door you're mm -hmm. responsible you underwrite it you got to update the investor update the bankers mm. taking all the liability carrying all the stress for those 140 door but you're only getting 10 to 12 percent of 140 when you own 14 door 100 percent by yourself mm. before to nobody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hey well i i now, love how, how, how i know that because i used to do that yeah See? i love I, I i've researched all the syndicators right i went deep on grant i went deep on all of them and just haven't pulled the trigger on doing it because the market kind of got a little wonky right when I was thinking about doing it. I'm kind of letting the dust settle. But in the meantime, I've just been picking up properties on my own and I and I love it because I'm like, I own this. Like, this is all me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people people, well, people get sold on the hype of number of doors, just like realtor. Oh, yeah, me and my team of 80 sold a me, you know, a half a billion dollar. But you only took home goddamn three million, dude. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. Well, te team leaders make, a make less than a lot of single agents. hundred percent. You know? So what, what's, what, what's the future here? So you've got your investment like portfolio, you're still doing real estate agent sales, right? Kind of on the side. You've also got education business, correct? Tell me a little bit about the education business. My whole focus on education is just teaching people the mindset. Most importantly, the mindset the uh the mindset the ideas and the inspiration and the benefit of owning long term mm. i always say to people i want to teach you how to have a long time i want to teach you how to have long 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 wealth versus a high paying job so mm. i don't want to teach you how to fix and flip i can teach you how to do that because i do that already mm. i can teach you how to wholesale now let's have i have a whole bunch of students that come through at the wholesale but they have the end goal in mind as long term Mm -hmm. It's like being a realtor, right? You come in as a realtor, but I got you really thinking owning rental. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So my whole education is how to own rental. Mm -hmm. The benefit. All the benefit, why own rental? All the pain if you don't own rental. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? That's my whole education piece of it. So what what got you into that? And how, how long have you been doing that? And how many students have you had? Yeah, good question. So I never thought about doing it. Mm -hmm. As I was doing it, just like you, one of my friends said, dude, Help me own rental property. So I helped one friend that helped another friend. And I've been doing that for a year behind all the social media stuff. I was helping so many friends on Seattle buying rentals, buying rental, buying rental, right? And even clients buying rentals. Mm. And then about five years ago, right? All of a sudden, you know, one of my friends says, my friend Stephanie, who's my partner today, she said, why don't you just let me just help you whatever you need in the back end. And then you just go and talk. All right. And I started it. And, you know, when I first did it five years ago, it wasn't really a coaching business. It was more like, I'm going to go do a seminar. I'm going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Not like how it is today. And I did that for two years. We were just making decent money. It wasn't a lot, dude. And then all of a sudden, one of my other friends called, hey, man, if you're going to do this, let me just teach you how to do it right. Mm -hmm. A funnel, the everything. I'm like, okay. Right. I was just going along with the ride. Right. And so, mm -hmm. Three years ago, when I really started it, 2020, mm. and we launched it, you know, the right way. And um, and then, so it's been three years now since I've done it now. So we have probably over 2,000, 3,000 students now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and now it just, at a point now, it just, with social media and what I do every day and the word of mouth is just like the avalanche. It's just an opportunity to just keep rolling and rolling and rolling for me right now. Yeah, I know it's but the a content, but the content of what I do every day and what I share. Because my content, you know, to do to my content, everybody else's content, is I do it every day and I just share what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're documenting. Different. I'm documenting and I'm making video on what I'm building, what I'm learning, or the good, the bad, the ugly. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's different than everybody else out there. You know what I mean? You 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 strike me as a guy that probably do, doesn't even realize you have a million followers on Instagram. You know what, bro? I, when I started <laughs> this stuff, I was just doing it just to educate people, inspire and empower people. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, I looked back and I got a hundred thousand, two thousand, hundred thousand. And all of a sudden a million followers like, Whoa. 
you know? Mm. Um, and so now it's like, whatever, you know what I mean? And mm. my, my inspiration today is really trying to help a lot of people mm. understand the benefit only long-term rental, just like what you yeah. know. Right. Right. And from here, bro. Okay. You got investing, you got real estate agent and you got the education. What, what's the future? Like, what's the goal? Like, what are you trying to do? Is there a point where you ride off into the sunset? What, what's, what's the end game? Well, my kid, Russell, is a senior. My second kid, Hudson's a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always going to be working because I'm a creative person. Mm -hmm. But I want to do it on my time. It's like a realtor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I take a listing when I want to take a listing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in this business, I already have enough in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. But the first thing is I'm always going to be buying. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my portfolio is already paid off. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I always look at my portfolio, Ricky, and if I see good opportunity, I might look at some of my portfolio and go, you know what? Let me take some of these lower one that wasn't the best. I mean, they're all good stuff, but I always start the one on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trade the 1031 for the better stuff today. Okay. So I'm going to always, I'm going to always be looking at 1031 and just roll it into something better. Mm -hmm. And if there's an opportunity where I can't roll it, I'm just going to buy it. Because mm -hmm. I have too much money today. Right. So I'm still always going to be buying. At mm -hmm. the same time, with all the money I'm making right now, I'm just paying down more of my loan. Because for me, I have a lot of property now. I don't want to be 80 years old, Ricky, being in the boardroom, telling a banker, well, can you extend the loan? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right? I don't want a gun to my head. I want peace of mind. Peace mm -hmm. of mind, I think people underrated. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So my goal right now is to pay off a lot of my loan. When I get it all paid off, probably going to be $250,000, $300,000 a month in cash mm -hmm. flow for life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, the, the My portfolio in the next 20 years is going to hit a billion dollars with the yeah. assets. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, right? It's like a million, million subscriber or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm riding into the sunset. So I'm going to continue to 1031. I'm going to continue to buy. I'm doing that because it's fun for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. The education piece, I'm, just, I'm going with the flow right now. When I get tired, I might say, I might find another factory to work with Stephanie. Stephanie, is, she's a mindset coach, psychology coach. That's why she's part of the program. And she teaches that stuff. And I teach a lot of the real estate stuff. And I got so many students coming right now that are so phenomenal that they are coaching other students for me right now. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. So I see myself, you know, I'm 53 now. I'm 50, 53 now. I'll be 55 next two years. You know, I mean, the way I'm going, I could have fun doing this even in my 60s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Right now, I don't really have like a, you know, I want to hit X. I'm just enjoying right. myself now and just yeah. making a difference. A lot of people say, would say, hey, don't pay those properties off. You know, uh, take out more equity. You know, if you're paying stuff off, take out more equity, buy more properties. Right. What do you say to those people? It depends it depend how old you are. Mm -hmm. If you're young, leverage. Mm-hmm some point when you get older depending on how old you are 50 60 70 80 then why would you want to have 80 900 million dollar debt what would another 10 more property do for your life right but what would 10 property paid off do for you if it's free and clear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it all depends on your age so no one ever talks about that it depends on your age it depends on your specific goal it depends on your lifestyle some people Ricky is happy with their five rental property free and clear got five grand a month for life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're wrong no Mm -hmm. Not everybody want to leverage, leverage, leverage. Not yeah. everybody needs on the doors. Yeah. Right? But most American, this is what I, I found this out, Ricky. The average American, only 6% invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. The average American retired with $233,000 net worth. Mm. If you and I help them get two or three rental property, mm -hmm. in the next 10 years, they have more money than the average American. Right. So if they have, if let's to be honest, Ricky, if the average American have five grand in passive income from their rental, mm -hmm. they get done way better than Social Security. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, I mean, I can almost live off that, honestly. I mean, everything you know I have I mean? is pretty much paid off. Right? So you know? people get this perception when they go to seminars and social media. Oh, my God, John Doe got a thousand door. I need two thousand door. I need a thousand door like him. Uh -huh. Do you know why you even need a thousand door? Is your lifestyle even that high? Mm-hmm. If you have 10 grand a month debt free, you live so damn good, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So leverage, 
It all depends on your goals, how old you are, what lifestyle you want to have. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out, I've got, I've got this situation personally, I'm buying this office building, right? Yep. And so I have this big office building. It's about 2000 square feet and it's where my, my office is. And I've got one assistant that works there and I don't no, None of the local agents I have go there or anything. So I'm like, it's just sitting there. I could be making four grand a month. It's paid off, mm. paid cash for it. So I said, let me go buy this little, uh, smaller units, a thousand square foot. It's a nice little office in a strip center. Uh, for 200, the building's worth 500. So I, I'm buying this little unit for 200. I'm going to move my Christy, my assistant to the little building. And then I'm going to rent out the big building for like four yeah. grand. Okay. Yeah. And so my dilemma right now is, is I got, I got money in the bank. I could pay cash for that $200,000 unit, but I also have that equity sitting in that big, big office. And I'm like, should I take out two or even 300 of that? put 200 towards this little office and then have a hundred cash as tax free, of course, and take that hundred and maybe put it down on another property or something, you know, should I leverage that office or, or should I pay just cash for the, for the little office, own it all free and clear, have that 4,000 a month just coming in with no mortgage. Right. Yeah. And so that, yeah. that's the dilemma I've got right now. What, what, what say you? Well, you know, it, it all it all depends on another thing too, Ricky. Another equation is how much income coming through the front door. Plenty. Right? Okay, so like a couple me, hundred I, thousand. See, so if we have a lot of money coming through the front door. We don't need the cash to buy another property. We can use our own cash to buy. It. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, so it depends on someone's income, right? So for you, if you got good cash coming in every month, four hundred thousand dollars a month every month. Like I got active income still coming in millions of dollars every single month for me, mm -hmm. right? From all my business, mm -hmm. right? Not the cash flow. Cash flow is different. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I got that money coming every single month. Then I just use that cash to buy something and lease something off. Me. That's why I don't pull any of my equity out of my rentals. Mm -hmm. I leave it because I got cash coming through the front door every mm -hmm. single month. Yeah. Right? You just use that um, cash. I just use the cash. That way I can have debt-free, clear property. Now, how old are you, bro? I'm 42. Yeah. So for you, Ricky, like if you want to get to a hundred door or, or maybe it's not a hundred door, maybe it's a certain amount of, you know, a uh, 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 net, uh, not network, but passive income you want. It might be 75 doors. You know what I mean? And hundred thousand dollars a month in rent. So if you're there, Hey, instead of paying off, accumulate more, mm -hmm. post some of that money, I'll go accumulate more. Get yeah. to the number of door or the number of dollar capital you want, accumulate it, mm -hmm. leverage it, accumulate it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you get to, Hundred thousand a month in passive income in in rent. You can go now. I can pull. I can slow down a little bit. Let me just slow down. Uh, let me slow down this accumulation train for a second. Let me just take some of the four hundred grand making. Let me drop down on some of these properties and get them paid down. Some. Mm -hmm. But that's what I did for all the years, right? I got yeah. to a certain amount. But I paid off a bunch of them. Then I went for another couple hundred more doors, and I paid off a bunch of them. Then so now I'm at a point where a lot of my properties still not all free and clear. But I'm just gonna let rent pay itself. The tenant, mm -hmm. as I mm -hmm. look up buying better one and trade up if I if I wanted to, mm -hmm. you know. But I, you know, now I'm 53. By the time I'm like 65, Ricky, I don't really want to actually have any more debt, bro. I just want to just pay them off. Yeah. Because right now I'm making peak money right now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And at 65 years old, I want to be debt free, having 300 grand a month in rent coming in every single month, and I'm coaching people. I'm trading up, trading here, back and forth. You know, headache free, peace of mind. Mm -hmm. I want to do no brainer kind of work in my 60s. Cause that's going to yeah. be the best time of life to travel and do things. Who the hell want to have all the debt? So many young people right now, they're chasing after success. And their definite success is really not as they think it is. You know, everybody got their own definite for success. You know what I mean? That's the problem. Yeah. No, no you're absolutely right, man. And, um, I appreciate you coming on. Where where can people find all your stuff? Of course, Instagram. You guys just go follow him on Instagram. Number one, I'll put his link in the description, and um, I'll also put some links to your to some of your education stuff down there. Where where else can people find you? Or find me on um, Instagram, YouTube. Now I'm now I'm doing a lot of YouTube now. Okay. Right. I I post like a video every single every week now. Okay. Right? So YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, that's it. Cool, cool. I'm gonna link all those below your YouTube and stuff. And I didn't know you were on YouTube. Did you just start that? 
I started about uh, technically about three months ago. We're up to about okay. 150,000 subscribers. So I want to hit that that million. You know what I mean? Got to nice. get everything out there, baby. <laughs> so we, we got we got a lot of people, man. They got, we got a coach on Tom the benefit of owning rental. Mm -hmm. I love your message, so, man, about seller, investing. Yeah, you know the thing about interesting, Ricky, is wholesaler and flipper is like a realtor. Mm, right. This is a high paying job. Yeah, you're just, you're just making money <laughs> on a high paying job. transaction and then that's it. We I flipped about, well, well over 100 homes with two other partners over the past like six years or so. We buy them on the courthouse steps. And I'm like, my God, if we would have kept the best 30 of those, how much wealthier we would be. But these guys really love flipping. And I'm like. And so we're doing one right now. And I've got to the point where I'm like, you know what? If I like one of them, I'm just going to buy the other two guys out and just keep it yeah. myself, you know? That's it. That's um, it. Think about the, it. That's what I mean by sometimes we got to actually pull back a little bit of our lifestyle so you can keep it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Bro, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today, brother. Appreciate you. I appreciate it, bro. And I look forward on uh, on uh, sharing this with you when, when you post it. Yep. Yep. I'll, uh, I'll send it to you and everything you take care, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Peace out. See you, bro.